Hello there, everyone. I'm UXW Bill, and I find myself out here at this little country church again because after about a month and a half of pretty much flawless performance on Easter Sunday, this poor old church organ gave up the ghost. It would play short notes just fine, but whenever anybody asked it to play a particularly long note, it seemed to have a lot of trouble with that. The output got all warbly, and I wasn't here to witness it, unfortunately, so I don't know exactly what went wrong. I do know that this thing probably needs to be gone through and totally recapped, and that is something I have on my mind to do. Now, whether or not the elders with the church will go through with that, I don't know. They do have another organ that they can fall back on, but the organist is an elderly woman, and her bifocals do not work well with the newer of the two organs. She can't hardly read the sheet music. So the idea would be to get this organ going as reliably as possible with a minimum of disruption to the members of the congregation. Anyway, what I have done in the meantime, I have gone ahead and come out here with a few various parts and tools. One person, I believe it was the Tech Knight, said that the rectifier tube, to his eyes, the getter looked like it had done a lot of hours. So here I have two replacement 5U4 rectifier tubes. I should only need one, but it was cheaper to get two of them than it was one. And while we're poking around in there looking at vacuum tubes, I actually brought my tube tester out with me. Now, to be completely fair here, it has to be said the tube tester probably isn't in a whole lot better shape than the organ. In fact, it's probably in worse shape. I bought this at the Hamfest over a decade ago from a man's estate. Someone was selling it off. It worked at the time. I haven't restored it in any way, shape, or form. And the last time I probably used it for anything was likely sometime in 2008. And of course, as always, I've got my helper out here, the key keeper, and his girlfriend's out hiding in the truck. <laughs> So, we may be in for a whole lot of fun. I also call into question, and we're going to take the back off of this thing straight away, I call into question whether or not the tone wheel motor is actually starting and running. I don't know if it has any kind of a soft start circuit in it, but if it's having trouble, and I wonder if it might not be, that might explain the warbly behavior when longer notes were being played on the organ, or being attempted at being played. So let's go ahead and get the back off of this thing and just see what's going on. All right, well, for some reason, my stupid camcorder completely lost the plot, and what I was talking about didn't actually get committed to its memory card. So we'll go ahead and try again here. I started to say that I'm suspicious of this tone wheel operation motor not starting up when the organ is running reliably, and I don't know if it would be due to this capacitor potentially being weak, Certainly looks like it could very definitely be the original. Or if this poor thing just needs a drink of oil that it hasn't had in entirely too long. So I went ahead and turned it on, fully thinking that I was recording. And that motor, which I would have expected to take right off and start running immediately, didn't. It just kind of sat there. I don't think it's got any kind of a soft or delayed start mechanism or circuit attached to it. So we'll go ahead and turn the organ on and just see what happens here. It probably won't do it again, though. It'll probably work perfectly now I've actually got the video camera running. Nope, there it is. Just humming away. Hasn't started yet. I certainly would have expected that motor to kick off and run immediately. And it's not doing that. The shaft turns. Not sure how much resistance it ought to have when it turns. It's not exactly effortless to do it. But yeah, something is definitely not quite right there. And maybe that would explain the unstable performance on longer musical notes. I sure don't know. This is what you would call a particularly revolting development. All the motor leads are soldered to this capacitor. Evidently, they never expected it would need replacing, or maybe they expected you to replace it as a unit. I thought I would check the value of this capacitor just to see if it was still in the ballpark, rather than trying to stick my hand in there, perhaps unwisely, and give that motor a boost and help it to start. But 
looks like that's my only other option at this point because I didn't bring my soldering gun with me to try and detach any of the leads from that capacitor. Alright, what I'm about to do is probably dangerous, and remember, I am a professional bad example. Luckily, I've got an assistant with me, and hopefully, if I get in trouble here, he'll end up uh, being able to call the police or the ambulance or something like that. You can test these capacitors while the unit is running, but I don't remember the exact methodology and formulas and measurements that you have to take in order to get that done. So I am, perhaps rather unwisely, going to stick my hand in there and try to help that little motor start when I turn the power on. I don't even know which direction it's supposed to run. But this is probably not the best idea in the world. Okay. It started off and ran with a little bit of help. Also notice that the speed kind of seems to wander around. And I would expect that should be a line synchronous motor because that's how this thing is inevitably going to be kept in tune by the rotational speed of that motor. But I'll go ahead and let it warm up and we'll just see if it comes up here. Looks like the tubes are lighting up so that's a good sign. In taking a closer look at this little motor run capacitor I have come to strongly believe that it is not original to the organ, that someone was in here before I was and they replaced it. There are two things that strongly suggest this to be the case. The first is a code that's printed underneath all of the information on the capacitor about its specifications, brand name, and working voltage. There's a four digit number on there that reads 7739 and I strongly believe that to be a date code of some description as in 1977 39th week. Now, I did actually remove one of the leads from this capacitor. I just clipped it off, and I'll put it back a little bit later before I leave, just so I could make a test. When I put my multimeter across it, and again, there are all sorts of disclaimers that come with making a test like that. For example, it doesn't test the capacitor under anything like normal working conditions. But when I did that, although it did at first settle on a value of around 3.5 microfarads, it later jumped around a bunch and went to zero briefly. That would tend to make me think that this capacitor probably has issues of some kind. The second thing that gives me an ocean, someone was in here. I clipped off the black wire, but look what I found resting in this tray. Two little bits of red and yellow wire. I doubt very much that's been in there since the day this thing left the Hammond factory. And I also have to wonder if Hammond would have actually soldered these connections as someone did, or if they simply would have used a push-on spade style connector as I intend to do. There certainly is an argument for soldering them in place, a soldered connection that's made properly. You'd never have to worry about it vibrating loose from any noise that the organ might happen to make at whatever intensity level the player happened to choose. But I doubt that would really be a problem with a properly attached lug style connector or a push on spade style connector. I tend to use those two terms interchangeably though they're different things. So for right now that's probably what I'm going to do because like I said earlier, I have no idea where my, uh, where my high power soldering gun is. And I would probably need it in order to get these disconnected and hooked up again. But I'm definitely going to put one of these on the bill of materials. I had to deploy a precision tapping tool. <laughs> yeah, tapping on the rectifier tube got it to run, so do we have a problem with the tube socket or the tube itself? Well, that's what we're going to try to find out. We're going to see if I can let some smoke out of that tube tester over there. Probably can. Alright, so in an effort to try and limit the amount of smoke here that I might end up producing, because I happen to be a humongous coward and I really don't like it when electronic devices fail violently. Not that I'm expecting that. I expect if this thing's gone completely pear-shaped then it just won't work anymore. It'll blow an internal fuse or something along those lines. But what I've got going on here, I have my variable auto transformer so I can bring up the line voltage gradually. And then, as an added means of insurance, although you wouldn't always use these two tools together, I also have what is called a dim bulb tester. And it is called that not because of the guy who's using it, but rather because it serves as a current limiting and short circuit protection device. Now the protection it affords is not absolute, and some devices won't work with this approach, like switch mode power supplies and things like that. 
but something as simple as this old tube tester and many other tube type electronics ought to work just fine. The idea is that if everything's in good shape and nothing's shorted and nothing's failed, then the light bulb should only illuminate dimly, if at all. If the light bulb illuminates brightly, you've got a problem. And that's what this little plug is here for. This is a test. This is a dead short. That's why I attached it with a zip tie, so that it wouldn't get away from the thing itself, at least not easily, and someone wouldn't go and plug this into an outlet and give themselves quite a hair-raising surprise as well as a little flash and a little boom. So what we'll do here, we've already turned on the uh, auto transformer. We'll bring it up to the approximate level for line voltage. You'll notice I'm setting it somewhat low, but that's because the line voltage out here is high. And right now, the bulb's not illuminated, but here's my short circuit. I plug it in, and instead of disaster occurring, I just let the bulb. So that is how it serves to protect by limiting the amount of current that can flow into a suspicious device or device under test. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to set this thing up to test a 5U4 rectifier tube and then we'll bring it up gradually and see if it still works as a tube tester. Because like I say, I could just plug this in, but I'm kind of a chicken. <laughs> I'm more than kind of a chicken. Okay, here goes nothing. Okay, well the tube tester says that the rectifier tube is actually good, if it can be believed, which <laughs> may or may not be real plausible. Because like I say, it's not really in the best shape ever. Let's see, are we getting any heater action out of that tube? Not that I can really see. And of course the ultimate test of whether or not a tube is actually any good is how it performs in an actual circuit. We could be dealing with a bad tube socket here. I didn't bring any contact cleaner with me, but I certainly thought about it. I guess we could try one of my known good tubes and see how it behaves. Alright, so here's one of my known good new old stock tubes. And again, the tube tester says it's alright, as well it should in that case. Nothing's exploded yet, so that's a good sign. Now, I don't have any reason to believe that there's anything wrong with them, but I did just go ahead and pull out one of the audio power output tubes. One of the two 6BQ6s, or EL84s. So we'll go ahead and try that out and see what it does. Well, it's a little bit questionable. Again, if this tester is to be believed at this point. But it's definitely powering that tube. I might go ahead and get him a set of those. Just because that does appear to be a little bit on the weak side and those shouldn't be tremendously expensive. Let's try the other one and see if they're still a pretty evenly matched pair, at least in as much as the tester can tell me that. Which again, is not hardly an absolute. But it's a guidepost. It Gives you a jumping off point at least. I haven't lit the bulb yet. Alright, this is the second power tube. And it might be marginally stronger than the first one, but it too looks a little bit on the weak side. Now, unlike a lot of simpler tube testers that simply give you a go, no go indication by testing the tube's emission. This tester is capable of another test known as mutual conductance. And I've got it set up to make that test with this 12AX7 from the organ right now. This tube tested good as far as emission is concerned. Let's see how it does on the mutual conductance test. Well, even though the original rectifier tube certainly tests good, 
One thing cannot be disputed. The replacement tubes that I bought actually fit much more firmly in the socket than the original. So as cheap as they were, and the fact that I have no need of them myself, although I do have one device, an old night hi-fi stereo amplifier that makes use of a 5U4 rectifier, I'm just going to leave these here in the care of the church, and if I ever need one for myself, well, I'll just go out and buy one. There's no reason that I just can't leave a spare tucked in the organ, including their original, because it certainly still seems to be good. Again, I suspect the right thing to do is to clean that tube socket, but I didn't bring anything with me to facilitate doing that today. So it's kind of one of those things that turns into how many times have you got to fix it before it's fixed. I'm also going to give that motor a little drink of oil, and I'm going to try to give the rest of the organ a drink of oil too, if I think I'm smart enough to do it, which I wouldn't really personally bet on. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and see how it performs with that new rectifier tube in place. I'll have to go plug it in. Hmm, seemed I had a hair on my lens there. Better keep that down, everybody else might want one. All right, there, there it is again. There's the new rectifier tube in place. Let's just see if she goes up in smoke. A little motor lit right off this time, so that's a good sign. And our filament is definitely glowing inside that rectifier tube. So let's just see. If the old organ will make some noise, or start smoking. I think it plays louder. That got a pretty good laugh. <laughs> sounds like an organ to me. I say that with some qualifications though because I'm about as clued up on organs as I am fashion sense. <laughs> okay, we'll do that again because the vibrato was turned on without my knowing about it and it certainly does have an effect. if they could have turned it on by mistake, maybe bumped into it or something. For those of you in the viewing audience who happen to be wondering, yes, I do plan to perform a complete recap of this organ. And I may go through and check out some of these resistors and stuff and make sure they haven't drifted terribly far out of tolerance. But this does present some unique challenges along the way. First of all, this isn't something I've done in a long time. I did rebuild a couple of tube type radios many years ago but all the lessons I learned from that I've forgotten. I don't feel as comfortable working on this point-to-point -point stuff as I do on stuff that's actually got a printed circuit board just because I haven't done as much of it. And of course, there's the matter of finding values on some of these components. Now, in some cases, it's extremely obvious. That little capacitor right there is right out where you can see it and it's perfectly readable. Some of these other ones, I'd probably have to cut them out or find them on the schematic. Now in the case of capacitors like this little Mallory cap right here, where I can see the working voltage, I'd feel pretty confident in my ability to find that. 
but these guys that don't have any markings on them, I'd be a little more nervous about knowing that I'd found the proper capacitors on the schematic. Though again, there are two of them, so by process of elimination you could do something like that. The trouble is if I have to cut any of these out to remove them, I don't have any capacitors in stock that go up to these high voltages. I'd have to order them and I don't know that I could have them inside of a week. And a week is all I've got to steal this thing away and work on it because come Sunday morning the congregation needs this thing. Yeah, there's the other organ and I suppose they could use it in an emergency, but I'd rather they didn't have to because it doesn't sound anything like as good and the organist being elderly, she doesn't really have a very enjoyable time using it. So there are some unique challenges to go along with this restoration and while I would like to haul this thing away and just, you know, have at it for maybe a week or two to do everything that needs to be done. Unfortunately, I don't really have that luxury. I also have to work within the limits of my own finances because whether I should or not, I am donating this entire effort to this church. I feel that that's really the only right thing to do, and so it is what I am doing. As I mentioned previously, I'm leaving them a brand new rectifier in there in case they ever need it. I also have a brand new rectifier installed there. The old one tested strong, but it did fit well in the socket, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the tube socket, so just not going to worry about that. There are a few other interesting things I would like to note as concerns this power amplifier chassis. It's the one that I've looked at in the most detail. I wonder if these two dry electrolytic filter capacitors over here, I wonder if someone hasn't restuffed them because if you look down here, you'll see that there's some kind of a residue down there. I don't think that's capacitor glop. I don't think that's something that's leaked out of those cans. I wonder if someone cut them off flush with the base, although if they did so, they did an extremely precise job of it. Although they could have certainly gone slow and worked very carefully. But I wonder if somebody didn't take those apart, clear the old capacitor guts out of them, and restuff them with brand new, modern, much more reliable capacitors than what would have been in there from the factory. I have a little bit of a hard time believing that 50 plus years later that those would still be good, but maybe they are. They certainly don't get warm in operation. They don't give any indication of being distressed. As far as this large Mallory paper-covered capacitor over here, it's much the same thing. It's a dry electrolytic. This one does get a little bit warm in operation, but not alarmingly so. Still, I do have some questions about its state of health, so it will definitely be going away. And if I find that these haven't been restuffed, or if they look like they've been restuffed a very long time ago with something that wouldn't be as reliable as a modern capacitor, those will be going too. So there might just be more videos about this organ in the future, but for today that's going to wrap it up. They need it tomorrow. I left a note in here about what I did. Hopefully that'll buy me some time to get my parts ordered. Started making a list here just to see what I need to get, and I'll start ordering this stuff and putting it in as time and finances both happen to permit. So thank you as always for watching. I certainly do hope that this video was interesting. If any of you out there have ever redone one of these organs and you have some tips, hints, pitfalls to avoid, things like that, I'd certainly love to hear them. Especially since I'm wondering about the health of this little motor. Even after I lubricated it and let it run for a while, it still seems to be having some trouble starting up. So I may put a 3 microfarad capacitor on the shopping list as well. I can certainly bring my soldering gun in here and replace that any old time and see if it gives this motor a little bit of extra ability to kick itself on over and get started reliably because I think this might explain why the thing was having trouble sustaining the long notes that maybe this little motor wasn't running at quite the right speed. What I don't know is whether or not when you press down a key and sound a note on the organ, thus putting a tone wheel in circuit, if that results in any additional mechanical loading of the motor. So again, thank you all for watching. Certainly do hope you enjoyed what you saw. And as always, I'm interested in hearing your constructive commentary, especially if you've ever done any significant amount of work on these things.